Now this first recording covering the thyroid gland is going to cover just briefly the anatomy and histology of the gland, but also the synthesis of T3 and T4. Now the thyroid gland is a gland that has two lobes, and the two lobes are, some, here's a lobe here, here's a lobe here, separated by a region we call a isthmus. It's located in the anterior cervical region, just anterior to your trachea. It's below this structure here referred to as the thyroid cartilage, which is part of your larynx, or you, some of the people would refer to as your voice box. Now, if we look at the thyroid gland histologically, what you'll notice is a lot of what we refer to as follicles or thyroid follicles. They are the structures that will be um, associated with the production of thyroid hormones. The cells that line the follicle, you see right here, those are simple cuboidal cells referred to as follicular cells. The follicular cells produce T3 and T4. Now over here to the side, you see a cell referred to as a P cell, oh, sorry, a C cell. The C cell are also referred to as parafollicular cells because they're next to or nearby the follicular cells. They produce calcitonin, which is involved in calcium balance, but it's not important in adults. So we'll talk about that at a later time. Now, if someone refers to as thyroid hormones, they're specifically referring to T3 and T4, the thyroid metabolic hormones. They're not referring to calcitonin. Now, if we look back at the, the slide of the thyroid gland, you'll notice in the center of these thyroid follicles is this region here that you can kind of see a little bit here. This is referred to as colloidal material. It's actually a uh, protein called thyroglobulin, which has a lot of tyrosine residues with T3 and T4 attached to it. That's how we store our thyroid hormones. You have about a two to three months worth supply of hormones in the thyroid gland and under normal conditions. Now, if we look at a follicular cell up close, so you see here's a follicular cell. Here's where the, co the colloid is going to be, right in here, is we have a number of steps involved in the thyroid hormone synthesis. One of the things that's absolutely required is iodine. So we do have a pump in those follicular cells that will pump in iodine from your bloodstream. And this pump, you notice it says it's TSH sensitive mean it's regulated by the hormone TSH produced by the anterior pituitary. But before I continue on is all the rest of the steps I talk about with thyroid hormone synthesis are regulated by TSH. So all aspects of thyroid hormone synthesis are regulated by TSH. Now the iodine will need to be um, attached to the hydroxyl groups of tyrosine. Now tyrosine again is an amino acid. The thyroglobulin is, has a lot of tyrosine residues, and we have enzymes that will iodinate the, I, or the, the tyrosines with iodine. And the process by which we convert iodine, which is a mineral, which means it's organic, inorganic, and attached to something that's organic, such as thyroglobulin being a protein, they refer to that as organification. So that's one of the steps that's involved is we organify. Now here I'm going to show you is sh you don't have to memorize the structures of these but I just want you to be, to be aware of what they look like is when we put one iodine on a tyrosine they refer to it as monoiodotyrosine or short MIT. When we attach two iodines we call it diiodotyrosine or DIT. These two will use these two to make your T3 and T4 using a process referred to as coupling. Again, all the enzymes involved in these steps are regulated by TSH. To make T3, this is T3 over here because it has three iodines, we're going to couple one MIT with a DIT. To get T4, which is also referred to as thyroxine, is you're going to couple a DIT with another DIT, getting T4, which has four iodines. So these will be attached to those thyroglobulin molecules in that the follicular cavity, 
or the follicle cavity, and it's associated with that, that colloid. Now, when we need it, we're going to take off a piece of the membrane, grabbing some of this using endocytosis, an active transport process, where then that, that little vesicle will fuse with the lysosome. The lysosome will degrade the thyroglobulin to get T3 and T4. Any of the remaining amino acids that results from degradation or iodine will reuse. So we always say we're very green. We'll just reuse those in the synthesis of thyroglobulin and your thyroid hormones. T3 and T4 are lipid soluble. So they'll diffuse across the membrane and a large quantity of those hormones are gonna be bound to plasma proteins. These are the three major plasma proteins that T3 and T4 will be bound to. Albumin, transthyretin, also named because it, it transports retinol A, but this is the biggest one, TBG. TBG is thyroid binding globulin. Now, being bound to a plasma protein will increase the half-life of that particular hormone. So any hormones that are, you're going to see a lot bound to plasma proteins, they tend to have a longer half-life, which means it's going to take a little bit longer before those are going to be broken down, which gives you an advantage because if you break it down before you can have a physiologic effect, it kind of does you, doesn't do you any good. One of the other common themes that you're going to see is hormones that are lipid soluble tend to be are transported bound to plasma proteins because they don't like that aqueous environment. So a large amount of them tend to be transported via um, plasma proteins. Now when we look at T3 and T4 levels leaving the thyroid gland, the majority of the hormone secreted by the thyroid gland is T4. So write that down. So most of the hormones secreted by the thyroid gland is T4. Thing is T4 is considered a pro-hormone. T4 must be converted to T3 to be metabolically active. So think of it as like a precursor hormone. So T4, and we're going we're to kind of compare and contrast T4 and T3, is we said T4, most of the hormone produced by the thyroid gland is T4. T4 has a longer half-life than T3 because it binds to the plasma proteins with a greater affinity. So it lasts longer. So when we need T3, we're just going to convert T4 to T3. We're going to deiodinate it. So you're going to remove an iodine because the only difference is one iodine. Okay, so again, here's T4, here's T3. They're derived from tyrosine residues. T4 has four iodines. T3 has three. You have to cut off this iodine to have T3 to be metabolically active. But most of the hormone released by the thyroid gland is T4, longer half-life because it binds to the proteins for the greater affinity. Now, the in lecture, what we'll do is we're going to discuss factors, dietary factors, drugs that can interfere with thyroid hormone synthesis. Sometimes we purposely want to interfere with thyroid hormone syn synthesis in case, say, someone is overproducing thyroid hormones. They're hyperthyroid. Um, but there are some things that you can be exposed to in the environment or eat, consume, that could affect thyroid hormone synthesis. So we'll, we'll discuss those in lecture. Now, so this is going to be the end of discussion of the, the histology the anatomy, brief anatomy of the thyroid gland and the synthesis of T3 and T4. The second um, recording will cover the regulation of thyroid hormones as well as the effects of thyroid hormones.